What's up guys, Drew here, and you're in for a real treat. Brad and I sat down with Chet Holm from Supermicro to discuss everything from industrial technology to Autobots and the next industrial evolution. Now, you're gonna to wanna to get your Google machines ready for this one because we cover a lot really fast. Also, don't forget to like, subscribe, and sign up for notifications so that you don't miss out on any future content that we post. Also, down in the comment section below, let us know what your favorite IoT device is. Hint, there's no wrong answer, and at the end of the video, I'll tell you mine. Now, let's jump into the interview. Welcome, everyone, to The Edge, a TMG Corp production. I'm Drew Null. And I'm Brad Furnish. And today we have a special guest with us, Chet Hullum, Senior Director of IoT Business Development at Supermicro. Chet previously held positions as the General Manager of the Intel IoT Industrial Business Unit, as well as various roles in engineering and product development for General Electric Energy Services, which also included Chief Marketing Officer. Chet has an extensive background and expertise in the field of industrial engineering, as well as the IoT and edge computing aspects of the supportive infrastructure. Currently, with Supermicro, Chet is involved in some very cutting-edge projects around the edge computing and IoT space that I'm sure we'll get into today. So, Chet, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, Chet, one of the things that we ask all of our guests on the show as a bit of an icebreaker, if you will, uh, if you could just briefly describe, uh, you know, some unexpected event uh, in your career, whether that's a positive event or some sort of a character yeah. building moment, uh, just something that you didn't expect, um, you know, kind of through your path. Um, it doesn't have to be long, just a little brief nugget yeah, yeah. for our listeners. Yeah. Um, wow. I think it's, um, you know, I, in my career, uh, if you look at my background, people say, well, wow, how did you end up from here to there? And uh, particularly around the theme of data, right? I think that was a big uh, point uh, for me. Um, I had been a field engineer and I, you know, and I thought, you know, I went to mechanical engineering school, got a bachelor. I thought I'd be designing cool cars or something like that or, you know, and so I did switch over to design engineering for some time, but realized that there was so much power uh, in all of the technology that was happening around really uh, data and it, remote monitoring, diagnostics, things like that. And I know that sounds like where we are today, but this is, you know, late 90s, early 2000s and web pages were just, you know, people were trying to do new thing, e-commerce and all these kinds of things. And so it, it really changed my trajectory in my career. When I started to get involved with that, I became a product service engineer for GE. Uh, they thought that my mix of field engineering and design engineering was a great mix for product service and helping customers. And it just really kind of changed the whole course to, to be more uh, data centric, right? And in, in how we look at things and how we solve problems. Sure. No, that's awesome. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. So, you know, Chet, we have a pretty broad range of backgrounds of our listeners. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you gave a little bit of a brief overview of your background right there, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s. But if you could, you know, give us a, a little bit deeper dive of how we got to where you are today and it's super micro. Mm -hmm. And then honestly, you know, give some of our listeners, you know, the definition of what industrial operations technology is and yeah, kind yeah. of the evolution of that space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and this is, uh, I, I will take it from the where industry I was in with power, <clears throat> but generally this speaks across with manufacturing and, and other places as well. And um, I was lucky enough <clears throat> to be able to do application engineering of solutions in different segments, food and beverage, mining, metal. So I started to understand that this problem was uh, larger than just in energy <clears throat> in terms of manufacturers and folks really needing to uh, continuously operate, right? And be able to um, stay on top of technology and move with technology. It's a difficult task when you're making something specific, petrochem, power, if you're in a mine and you're, you're making copper. And what you, know, what you notice is that the equipment, sometimes it, the technology outpaces your equipment that you have. And you're very dependent on large OEMs like a GE or a Siemens or, you know, some of the folks like that. And um, it, uh, it, it sort of inhibits you to keep up with the technology. And so I've been able to um, sort of match my career with that step. And um, 
<clears throat> when I was starting in marketing at, at Energy Services with GE, our biggest thing was, look, this, this industrial internet, and GE termed that quite a bit. There was a big paper I was a part of, and we wrote about, like, what does it mean for us to actually have data and what we could do for our customers, whether that's on an aircraft engine, whether it's on a power generation, a pump, a motor, and what could you do with better service? What could the customer do? And um, that really set a whole growth segment, really. And uh, GE went full in with what they did with creating a digital environment. <clears throat> for me, uh, that led me over to Intel. And uh, you know what, uh, it, how the ecosystem players played in this in terms of ODMs, um, ISVs, cloud service providers, et cetera. And that really led me into being more interested in this thing that now was starting to become IoT or industrial IoT. And, um, <clears throat> and that was really the, the crust of it. So I understood the rationale behind the problems and understood that there were many industrial players that were having problems with these areas. And now it's just so exciting that the technology is there and it's really about how to deploy. How do you get this in your place? How do you get this in your environment? Take advantage of these solutions that are out there, whether they're software or hardware. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so once I started doing the marketing, I had an opportunity with Intel. I met a, uh, great, a few folks there that were working in this space. And I realized that there was a broad ecosystem that was really, it was not just OEMs. It was a broader ecosystem that was bringing products and solutions to space. And I just wanted to be a part of it. So I just wanted to be part of IoT and and um that's what led me there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. And I'm I'm interested, you know, you mentioned that sometimes the technology outpaces the the manufacturing and and, mm -hmm. and those types of processes. And from what we're seeing, and and I, I would imagine you are as well, like the technology development isn't slowing, right? I mean, we're it's yeah. pushing faster and faster, and that's where we're at in our space of how do we develop better, faster, more efficient, more cost-effective things. So as that curve is increasing, is there a, a more widening gap between the technology that's being developed and, and then those, the manufacturing, the supply chain, those kinds of things? And, and if yeah. so, how do you bridge that? Yeah, it, it, it very much is. And um, different end users are, are in different places, right? In terms of, uh, their uh, innovation curve, right? Uh, sometimes customers are laggards, right? They, they, and it's a bad word, but it basically means like they're not going to be on the forefront. They don't invest necessarily in that type of research technology. They're more so going to look, as the market changes, I'm going to adapt and change, right? I'm going to wait for those products to be available and then I will take advantage of them. Other customers are on the forefront of that, right? And pushing the envelope about what they can do. And you look at different forms and different uh, communities uh, where there's leaders and different businesses that do that. Some of it's out of necessity, you know, whether it's competition, environmental solutions, regulation. You look at the energy market, a lot of what you need to have is because of regulate, because of different uh, elements of regulation around uh, renewables. Right. Uh, you look at uh, oil and gas and think about environmental solutions that you need. Right. It's not acceptable that you don't know what's going on at a wellhead. Right. Whether that's submersible under the ocean or in the middle of uh, some open space in Canada. So it's it's important then to be able to to take these technologies, adapt them to your environment and get them deployed. And I think that's where we are in a lot of these markets, industrials. And as soon as someone does it, then it starts to change. It starts to be part of the norm. And in some more regulated places like energy and things like that, uh, you know, governments get involved and, and they get accepted. Pharmaceuticals, you know, if they can uh, do something that um, secures uh, shipments of product, Right. And uh, understanding the cold chain and understanding all those elements, then all of a sudden it's like, well, yeah, that's the normal way to do it. Right. That's the best way to do it. We're not going to do this old way where you got, you know, someone checking the thermometer and keeping records that you can't keep up with. And, you know, food and beverage is an excellent example of how supply chain is just, you know, driving towards this technology. Right. Because we want to be safe. You know, and I think uh, even some of the recent things with COVID is, is presenting opportunities in many areas of technology and IoT, whether it's 
how do I change my factory quickly, right? To go from making, you know, drapes to masks or PPE. How do I uh, protect my workers, right? How do I know where they are in my plant? Um, you know, there's all these elements. And then, of course, the product itself and product quality and product control. And um, what seemed to be a nicety, maybe five, 10 years, is starting to be more like, look, we, we, we're going to have to have this, right? So we need to use this technology and get it out there. So I see sort of a, a big influx of market opportunity and um, uh, for companies and, and technology opportunity to match what, what the needs are. Yeah. And do you see, you know, when we coming from a more traditional, you know, data center background, we understand life cycles of technology, right? That's that whole refresh of depending on who you ask, right? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Obviously the OEMs wanted on a three-year life cycle, the end user wants a 10-year life cycle. And so probably fall somewhere in between in, in the industrial space. Um, are those life cycles because of the, necess- the necessity of that kind of ever evolving target? Mm-hmm. Uh, do you see truncated life cycles in the technology or are people yeah. adapting current technology? Like h- how does that life cycle really look? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's got a match. I think before we saw industrial, a lot of requests for 10, 15 year, you know, life cycles on products. 15 years, right? Literally um, at, at Intel. And you're talking about TikTok. And so, so really, and so customers want to secure their supply chain in industrial, be able to deploy those products. If you're an OEM or an ODM, you know, like a GE or whatever. And you need that sort of be able to do that. Now, match that with an end user that previously was like, look, don't touch my plant. Right. I, I like my ISA 95, 19, you know, 85 control system. I'm not going to, I'm not going to change that because it makes great product. I don't want to upset the apple cart and it matches kind of what you need. Well, now you've got an end user with the problems we highlighted just before saying, wait a minute, I need to be more flexible. I got to be interoperable. I got to have autonomous. I got to be more productive. I've got to do all these different things. I got to meet regulations. So now it's kind of a push to say, no, I need this technology a little faster. So I think what you're going to see is more um, uh, decisions on end users to move more from a CapEx model to an OpEx model, really, and really start to understand like, wait, I need to refresh this on a faster cycle. Software companies have been dealing with this. Gosh, but how do I refresh my environment and, you know, and, and, and do all of those things. And so you walk around a plant today and you, you see uh, controllers with, with outdated software and technology on it. And it's really um, quite scary in a lot of, in a lot of cases, because you think about our dependency on some of these things. So I think you'll see more elements of a shortening of that cycle, not from an aspect of why it's good for the suppliers, the the technology team, but more so because the end users are pushing more to say, look, I got to refresh this at a different rate. And I'm going to change my business model, be able to adapt that. And that makes perfect sense. And obviously, you know, with that comes, comes a lot of change. So from, you know, both sides, you know, the, the operator and the end user and the supplier, how do you go about that change management. What is the best way to go about that change management? I that's, mean, that's the hard a, part. That's the hard part. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think I've always said I think that point solutions are sort of, um, for lack of a better word, they're they're less resistant. They're easy. They're easy to deploy. You know, if you said, "Hey, look, I want to put a camera here, get some visual imaging, and use that in my quality control," it's easy to do. If I want to monitor a paint booth, you know, I, I want to. Um, at, change my data center to be, you know, whatever, more on-prem, off-cloud, whatever. And I think those are point areas that start to move the needle, right? And change here, a little change here, a little change here. But the big domino really has to come from an aspect of architecture. It really has to come with the end user saying, look, they can take a step back and say, I need my system to work this way. Here's my refresh cycle. Here's how I'm adapting these technology. Here's where I need to put compute. Here's where I need to put analytics. Here's where I need to put AI. And taking a step back and looking at that in a broader picture. When you think about it, when we, when someone, I didn't, it wasn't the one, but when someone designed that first control system that, 
EHC or even a man, they looked at it from a broader picture. And I'm, I'm big on controls because I, so I did as a field engineer. But, it, you know, they looked at it from a bigger picture, right, as a total plan, as a total system. You, you don't look at it as a point area and say, well, I need to control that machine. You, you, you have to look at it in the broader s- a sense of all the different inputs, outputs, all the different relays, all the different um, communications going on. The same is true with this IoT change and all these technology changes. You've got to step back, make sure you do your architecture. And it's like, what do you want to have in your plan to optimize these, these capabilities and sort of ingest them? as you need them. And now it fits, right? Now what am I doing with my data? It's here. I'm doing it. And you're not making a decision on a point solution. You're making a decision on a broader transformation. And so that's what I would advise any end user to really think about, right? Like how does this fit in your overall scheme, your overall architecture, what you're trying to do? Yeah. Do you see that there's new services or offerings, technologies that are making that transition or, or integration easier yeah. or faster, more efficient. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, you, you kind of detailed out some of those things yeah. that people have been doing, but obviously part of that innovation curve is not only innovating the technology, but some, I would imagine, end users, to your point, they want it to be better, but maybe they don't yeah. know how, they don't have the expertise or the man, but what are some of the things that are, are helping that integration yeah. and adoption accelerate? Yeah, I think that one element is around vision and video, right? Video, visual analytics, uh, video technology, smart cameras. These are things that are easy deployable. They're data workloads. You can handle them with the types of uh, compute power you have in the marketplace today. Uh, gra- GPUs that can handle all this type of different things. So you can sort of add it on to an existing process. If I've got a robotic line and I, I want to put in some quality control measures that are huge savings and things like that, those are things that I can do and adapt. So it's very, those, are, those, are, those push over, you know, quite a bit because now all of a sudden you've got all this data. Now you've got to decide what's important, what's not. Oh, wait, I need algorithms. I need AI. I need data scientists. So it starts to really move. So I think vision and visual uh, video technology, uh, autonomous vehicle elements are there. Those are big things that start to uh, move the needle. Um, I think the push on a business side for a productivity um, solutions that are that are you know again the pressure from the marketplace is uh, something that that they ha- that is that is required. You take something like robotics, and it's one thing to have a robot in your factory, but when you talk about cobots. Right. And being able to work alongside a robot to be even more productive. I mean, you look at these things now, they might be in cages, they might be isolated. You, 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 you have certain inhibitors there because of, you know, human safety. But as you advance in functional safety software with autonomous vehicles leading the way, you know, those are things that push the envelope to say, well, wait a minute. Now we can work alongside robots. We can autonomously use these. And it creates a software defined, you know, kind of system that you can deploy new things. You can ask that robot to do different things than it was doing before. And you're, you feel good because all the safety measures are met in, in some of those uh, in the technology. So these are things that push as we advance in, in vision, advance in things like functional safety, advance in these areas. It pushes the envelope of what you can do and get deployed. And, and that's important. Yeah, that's awesome. And yeah, you mentioned autonomous vehicles and, and some mm-hmm. of those things and being able to put robots and autonomous stuff in different things. Obviously, that's a big change and a big jump from your normal manufacturing plant, you mm-hmm. know, of having a robot put some stuff together. And, you know, obviously, we're also in our space seeing people want to put, you know, data centers in, in random places, not, you know, your normal, yeah. you know, specific space. And honestly, right. some of these environments are pretty harsh. You know, so mm-hmm. how does how does that mix into play? What are some of the things that people need to look at? And mm-hmm. you know, I'm just kind of interested on that piece because obviously autonomous yeah. cars are coming, and you know, I've seen some people drive. That's not exactly your <laughs> your, your best environment. To put on, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think edge compute elements that you mentioned, like moving that compute, uh, allows then an ability. Uh, to de- to make those deployments happen, right? And be able to get those things going in different areas where you don't have it before, right? You, you didn't have it. You didn't have to worry about it. Um, so you're seeing the shift a bit uh, between manual elements and robotics coming into play. 
but also uh, with autonomous vehicles, there's a lot of technology that gets advanced with what they're doing there that you can deploy in the factory. And that's what I mentioned with the vision and visual to, you know, cameras and capabilities there. And then high process acceleration, because you got to make split second decisions. Um, but, you know, industrial you know, I have to, I haven't looked at autonomous in a while, but some of the timing constraints around autonomous and are they're matched by industrial, you know, processing, you know, because you have to be able to respond and control that fast and in what we call real time. Right. And that's an element. Real time is a big element that needs to be part of it. And um, there's wireless capability as well. But ultimately, you know, that is leading that edge compute to sort of push those products in. Then, okay, so what do I need in my server? I've got to be fanless. I've got to be ruggedized. I've got to meet these harsh environments here in this type of gateway box, et cetera, um, and meet certain requirements I didn't have to worry about in a traditional data center that's nicely cooled and, uh, you know, in a nice clean area, right? And and um, that's super important. Um, for the the products and and what you do what you see is a uh, super micro others as well um when i worked at intel very large you know channel group of of ecosystem players all considering these factors because industrial is a very large market so when these things start to change over these products need to be available right they're going to have to meet these basic requirements or you can't put it in because it's just gonna you know fail and, you know, burn up or explode or, you know, and so you've got to meet these environments. Now, some of the traditional OEMs have used to be in this environment, you know, uh, you know, some of the big OEMs, they've obviously been supplying equipment in this environment for a while, but general purpose compute, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Now that's, you know, it, it's in a new area and it's going to have to do this. And I think it's very unique to probably autonomous vehicle and, uh, industrial segment, the broader industrial energy, food and beverage, you know, all these different places. Um, then you find in a retail or some of these other places, it's not downplaying that they have different challenges, but it's not the, the environment as bad as what we find in industrial. And it is, and it, it can be bad. It can be very bad. Um, but here's the thing it's been done, you know, I mean, not, uh, there have been deployments on different scales, right? Autonomous vehicles, not new. You go to a mine, an underground mine, it's autonomous vehicles all over the place, right? Um, you know, and the challenges that they've had to deal with now, so these technologies start to help them a bit with what they can do uh, differently. Yeah, so I, you mentioned the the aspect of real time uh, in, in regards to, <laughs> to to all of this and the processing and, um, you know, from my very limited knowledge and research, there, 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 there's a balancing concept there between the, the real time data and then the depth of learning with the data, right? You, you kind of have to make yeah. those trade-offs, right? Um, That's right. That's right. And, and I'm curious, especially with your experience, I would imagine that, that you need, there's, there's a desire to have more of both, right? The, the, to your point, the real time, that, that's a yeah. necessity. You have to have that because otherwise things, don't, don't function right and you have issues. But as we as just a society and then as business, when you start talking about the, the monetization of that data and the deep learning and how you can be more efficient, that's got to be pushing the, the compute need because in order to get the yes, deeper absolutely. learning and maintain yeah. your real time, you're, you're really sectoring or you're, you're, you're playing into two sectors. One, the connectivity, right? And, and that's what we hear about all yeah. the 5G and the wireless and the broadband development. Yeah. At the same time, getting into that microprocessor, getting more out of smaller spaces so you can deploy it, yeah. right? And that there's like this intersection. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious as to kind of what the tipping point to where, from your perspective, yeah. what that tipping point is to where then we can really start to scale some of this stuff out. Yeah, and I, I think I think time is a big factor there. Uh, real time capabilities, and again, um, data processed into control answers, you know, or data just processed for um, a decision, you know, is, is what we talk about in this sort of software defined control element, and and real time is super important to be able to manage, to be able to make that happen at the, what I'll call edge edge. Cause sometimes we say edge and we think, okay, just from the cloud down, but there's, there's many levels there. And what I like to think about is the, the, the controls model, right? Level one through level five of control. It's all the way from that sensor saying, 
yes, no, temperature reading, high, low, you know, to the next device that's making some decision to then the next aggregation to the a broader aggregation. And, and that's why that architecture is so important. That's why I go back to, because it's like, if I'm an end user and I say, no, look, I want to do my analytics right there at that machine. I want all of these things feeding back to the person controlling it. I want the human involved. I want, you know, whatever that case may be and how they're working, they're doing that analytics at the edge. Well, that's going to require more compute right there, which is possible. That's fine. We'll put it right there. They may say, no, you know what? I don't want to, one, it's, it might be too costly. It's might, you know, something, but it's not the type of information I need. I just need it to tell me when there's a problem. Right. And, and it's simply, sort of passing through and at a broader level you're doing at a at a, a level two a level three you're doing a broader algorithm machine learning analytics elements that you're saying okay i'm learning that this machine is with all these other factors it's now saying i need this to be a different way i need it to operate a different way and you pull deploy down you deploy down and you tell that PLC to do something different than it was doing before. You tell that control device to do something different. And that's what I think is a nice, happy balance. That's the part that everyone kind of has to figure out is how do I take my current architected control system and then match that to what I want in those capabilities today? And then where do I put this these data elements of compute? Do I want it in the cloud? Obviously, you're not going to get time down the. Cl- you're not going to respond that fast from the cloud. It's just latency. So, so where do I need to respond? So that's why time becomes one of the key variables in that development. Where do I need to respond that fast? And where do I need? I can take time to analyze and then make a decision and redeploy something different if I need to do that. Right. In an autonomous vehicle, you can't do, I mean, imagine if you were, you know, driving and in order for it to determine if that's a stop sign or a red light, you know, it had to wait for the cloud to respond, right? Like you have to have an element of, of like immediate real time response. And that's why I said, like, in some cases, um, you know, an autonomous vehicle, you know, that time constraint might be a little bit longer, right? Because then, Think of a steel mill, you know, rolling out steel, you know, or, or something processing so fast in microseconds going past and you want to take a picture or a snapshot and then process what happened. That's, that, you know, you get, for your control to say go left or go right, right? And, and it, you need to do that in a, in a time constraint. So it's pushing um, the compute. It's pushing the software capability. Because a lot of it is not based in what um, what the hardware can do. A lot of it is based in what software can do and what you can do with virtualization, what you can do with containerization of software and be able to replicate, you know, decision making, what you can do with algorithms um, and data science behind that. So that's really, those are the big things that really tip the, the, the scale and, and how time is a critical factor in that, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, uh, that's interesting. And when I, you know, when I think about automation, you know, the processing and and everything, uh, I I guess maybe this is just my own personal hangup, but I, I, and I, I don't, I know I'm not alone in this when you're talking about automating an an entire factory, right. Or, Or lots and lots of processes in that factory. Um, What's the human element there, right? Because a lot of people hear that like, oh, we're going to automate this factory. You know, they're, all these robots are going to do all these things that humans used to do. Robots are going to take jobs from humans, those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know, when you, when you step back, it's not going to take jobs away. It's going to create different types of jobs, right? Because people still right, have right. to manage all that. But what you kind of hit on it a little bit in terms of how we can develop, you know, uh, co wrote Robotics, I think, was the term that you, you cobots. Cobots, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, what are where are we with? That? I mean, and yeah. kind of what's the development of that? I think that's a really interesting take on on technology yeah. in the industrial space. I, I think that's one of the big levers that you know. Look, I'm 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 pro worker in a lot of senses, instances and things like that. Um, I, but I think we sh- one. I don't I don't I think fearing technology is definitely the wrong you know 
broader scale way to think of it, um, because it does open up lots of different opportunities that people don't think about. Um, you know, uh, there's factory, there's supply chain, there's energy, there's all these different places where I see new um, uh, business models where, where people are involved, new jobs, new ways to do things, et cetera, that the technology is allowing them to do. Um, and I, I think it's important that we remember that um, we, we're, we're not going to stop this from, from evolving, right? It's, it's kind of like it, they're already here, you know, whether they're robots in different fashions or machines in different fashions. And we're very reliant on those technologies. The thing is, is that the capabilities can be very uh, helpful and I think some of the things around, like I talked about with functional safety, some of the things in software, as well as some hardware capabilities in time, can help us work alongside this in a, in a fashion that we feel safe, that we feel comfortable, and things like that. The other thing is worker solutions. And a lot of times we forget that IoT, there's a lot of worker solutions that protect them as well. Um, you know, uh, man down situations, heart monitoring for guys that are on rigs, you know, in, in the middle of the ocean. Um, machine human interface, right? HMI things that that require the, the human to be part of it, but how do you do it in such a way that you can protect them and make sure that they're not in harm's way and at the same time, they're even more productive than they were before and, and being able not to do it. So those technologies go right along with those things. You can't just think about robots and person leaves. It's, it's kind of robot comes in, now I need to create this technology bridge and there's a human there and whether they're doing data science on that or they're interfacing with that robot in a cobot situation, you know, cause I've, I've seen it in directory plants where you literally can have, you know, people handing things to robots to install, you know, and you're able to do that faster than someone picking something up, walking over and, you know, drilling it on and getting it wrong you know, and then taking it off and, then, you know, putting it back on and, and, and the line is moving, right? And so it's, it's an element of being more productive, but at the same time, uh, being able to protect your workers and get them uh, involved and, and doing solutions for them as well. And I don't mean just like, you know, things that just, you know, even protection type of equipment, right? Um, in regards to their health and safety. So. Yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, for me, it, it You've, you've touched on a couple of things and I, I actually, you know, not to, to scare Drew, but, you know, obviously you have machine learning and artificial intelligence and, you know, this concept of, you know, it's kind of new for a lot of people, digital twins. But, you know, I want to touch on the fact of you mentioned the safety pieces, you know, and there's a lot of technology that we already implement, you know, mm -hmm. that people don't think twice about that is artificial intelligence or is robotics, right. you know. And so for me, I, I. I'm fascinated, you know, because my mind's an analytical mind of, you know, the predictive analytics and kind of, you know, mm -hmm. for us coming from the data center model, we've always heard about, oh, here's computational fluid dynamics of, you know, if we put in this high density environment over in this corner, what does it do for the airflow around? And, you know, some of those yeah. things take take quite a bit of time. But from a factory and a plant perspective, to me, it's fascinating to go, okay, here's predictive analytics of you know, person A or robot A is moving too fast or moving too slow. And how does that affect, you know, yeah. person C, D and E? And ultimately, are we leading to a problem or a backup or even a catastrophe? Right. So for me, it's it's fascinating that you're touching on that. And I know, you know, yeah. digital twins is a scary concept for a lot of people because they just don't understand it. Um, yeah. But are you seeing digital twins come into play, you know, yeah. in your current role or have you seen it in the past? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've seen it in, in the past and even currently. Again, it, it leads to that element of needing that compute and the capabilities around hardware and software, of course. Um, and it, there's there's two elements to that. You know, one, you can actually understand what an anomaly is with a digital twin. Right. Um a lot of times that's the, the leading indicators are if you've ever done anything with data or if not, it's just something that you notice over time. It's a pattern behavior. And this is the point earlier, like why you don't need to maybe do that right at that pump or motor, but you 
analyze that in a bigger sense with bigger data and, you know, what's the weather outside and going, what are all these, who's my operator at the time? Who is this? You know, all these different factors that allow you to say, wait a minute, this is an anomaly. I know when an anomaly occurs and this is out of the norm and I can create a warning element to that. Right. And that is so important. Well, in order to do a lot of that analyzing, you need digital twin capability to understand the behaviors and just the material that you have in that in that plant in a digital environment. Because I could take that now, put it in an environment, understand it um, and the behaviors of the equipment in that environment and then come out with those different things that I say, look, we need to make sure we're monitoring X, Y, Z pumps because these are the things, these are the leading factors that we see, that we could see in a situation like that. So it's super important. The other thing it does is, and this is back to when we started even with GE and Digital Twin is the supply chain is so vital, right? Um, I mentioned this a little earlier, you know, whether you're uh, in food processing or pharmaceuticals or in manufacturing, you know, if we made a mistake in a manufacturing process with um, a part that we were making because the ingredients were bad and we didn't know it, right? When you got deployed in the field, well, you're, you're replacing everything because you don't know which one went where. You know, the recall, we all had recall situations in our cars, right? The reason there's a big recall is because they don't know if your part specifically got that particular defect but everybody's got to change. So just think about that in the aspect of COVID, in the aspect of all of these things, right? And having the, the ability to, it, within the data, to understand exactly what happened in that manufacturing process. I know when it was to put on, I know who put it on, I know how much torque went into that wrench, I know how much w was the weld quality, I know all this information. So if I have a problem, I can pinpoint and say, aha, it was when we changed out this welding machine, that's when we had the defect. So guess what? Everything else is fine. It's just that one, right? And I can pinpoint it and then I can not, it's it only business-wise, it saves money and warranty and costs. I'm an old product service guy. So like all of those things come into play, but it's also, it can also lead into a better supply chain awareness, right? Think about the food processing. I mean, I, I don't know where, where where viruses come from and all. That's a little out of my territory. But I I know from an aspect of understanding your supply chain, track and trace, uh, understanding where you know a shipment occurred and was it below fifty degrees the whole way, right? Or did it? You know, did the guy park the truck and it spiked to 110 degrees and now we've got bad, you know, bad food. You know, so it's like these elements that come into play. We've seen it, you know, E. coli breakouts, these kinds of things. These are things, these are real problems that are driving these factors of why. And we with Digital Twin, it's, it, it looks like, oh, it's just a cool concept. Oh, I can have uh, a turbine and I can have all of the digital elements of that and a digital environment. That's cool. It's, it's beyond cool. It's like really helping you do certain things and solve certain problems. So. Yeah, I even take that, you know, as you're talking about having all of this data and, and how things are processed and when they're processed and, and, and even who the operators are, uh, mm -hmm. you know, doing those things, you know, going back to the human element. I mean, my background's in managing people, right? And so I, I hear that and I go, well, holy crap, that's an awesome opportunity to, to better understand my, my, my workers, my, my staff, my operators. Um, one, you know, if, if I've got a guy that's better at one thing, you know, his productivity yeah. and his quality is higher on a certain operation or a certain piece of equipment or process, and it's lower over here, well, maybe I have the opportunity to, to, to have him do that more. Or if, if he has to do this other thing, now I know yeah. where my training needs to go for that guy. So rather than taking my entire workforce out of the line for a period of time and training everybody on everything that most of, maybe they only need 5% of that training because they're really good at the other 95%. I can train them specifically on the things that they're deficient on. So I optimize my training, I optimize my workforce, and ultimately my people are safer, they produce better, and, and at the end of the day, I, I'm putting out better product. That's exactly right. Yeah, that analytics, that analytics example, leading from that data, 
And whether you've done a great job of replicating what happens in your environment and you've got that and you can analyze it that way, or you're analyzing data you're collecting now, you know, and you're doing it that way, or both some combination, you're getting to better results for really not only the product, not only machine, but the human as well and the people involved in it. It really does drive that. Um, it, it creates a situation where you're able to do that. Now, many people say, and we have this problem, by the way, this was one of the human factors uh, in industrial is that you've got an aging workforce. You know, um, a lot of people, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, my path is, is not so unique, but it's, it's different than a lot of folks that have gone. And there's also a lot of, you know, elements that we don't have the type of workforce um, that is the same anymore. Right. And, and there is an element of digital and there is an element of, of a different worker coming into the environment. And so this creates a situation where, yeah, you do need to arm them with better information, right? And better technology because they aren't, it, it's not the way where it, you know, I've worked on the line for 30 years. Now I'm going here and all of my experience in my beautiful brain is telling me when I, I, I used to work around guys, this is no joke. I used to work around guys that could walk into a plant, hear a turbine running and tell you what they thought was wrong and be right pretty much most of the time, you know, <laughs> and that, that, but, but, you know, it, it, it leads from the art and the experience factor to then taking that data and say, well, um, unfortunately I don't have that same worker anymore. I've got a great worker coming out of college with a great set of school you know, skill set. They, they're the more computer savvy, more this, more that. I can utilize them in a way if I could give them data and information in such a way that they could actually, you know, be successful at it. And you, you sort of bridge that gap between experience and, you know, no experience and being able to do that. Many industrial players are, are struggling with that, right? Because that's, that's part of the problem of ad adoption, right? Because it's just, frankly, it's just, you know, it takes a lot to understand how things operate. And it takes years of experience and being able to have data and understand your environment, understand anomalies, understand how that gets detected is it helps the workforce tremendously. Yeah. And I would even think, you know, we've we've talked just amongst ourselves about, you know, the the the, the workforce, you know, like you said, the the, the industrial workforce is, is kind of aging you know, it, 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 the shift or the, the mean age is, is, is not as yeah, young, right? It's, the, it's, yeah, it's, it's not as young. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, we've talked about how just trades in general, like that age is, is increasing. You know, the, I think Brad, you always throw the stat, like the average yeah, age of a master electrician is what, like 57, 58, yeah. something, yeah, it's like 55, that. Yeah. something like that. It's their mid fifties, obviously, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's not young. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's not the same. Yeah. yeah and exactly. incorporating this technology, I, I believe would, would increase the interest in younger generation, you know, cause you know, like, the, the teenagers right now, the kids that are in high school right now, when they think of factory working and, and production and manufacturing, they, I, I would imagine most of them still yeah. probably have that old, I got to go swing a hammer. I got to put on, you know, I got to go, you know, I don't know anything about welding, but weld a bead or, yeah, you yeah. know, something like mm -hmm. that. They don't, I, I would imagine they don't think at all, or very few of them think there is a massive technology sector in all of that. And if we yes. can incorporate more of that, educate the younger generations of, dude, there's a massive amount of technology. And if you want to, you can still do the technology that, that you love, that you've grown up with, that, you know, that, that you're accustomed to, but you can go take it. You don't have to go, you know, program yeah. and do software. You can take your knowledge of tech and love of tech and go apply it into a more Absolutely. trade oriented sector. That's it. exactly right. I mean, and that input that you can provide creates the next generation of things. It, it just naturally does. And, and when you have the, uh, uh, someone that's thinking in that terms, right? Um, so that's why it's so important, right? It's not uh, going all the way back to the robot automation thing. It's so important that people understand that that's the type of worker you need 
to be able to get to those different levels because that's important too. They don't have to be data science, but but if I worked out what if we all walked out right now and said go do an IoT solution in a factory, the first person we would start with is the operator of those those machines. We talk to them. We would say, look, what are you doing here? What's going on? How's this going to be better? And they could give you simple things like, you know, um, you, you know, whether it's um, uh, parts not arriving on time. Um, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, smart tools, right? I've got a tool. It doesn't tell me when I've torqued well enough, you know, or something like that. All of these elements come into a, a play and the operators and workers are very vital to that. And when they're educated in this generally growing up with iPads and, you know, and, and come into this environment from an app, they'd probably simply say, why can't my phone tell me when, you know, I, I, I've done something right, right? Or I've, I've got a defect here, right? They would tell you that I need to be able to interface that. You know, 25 years ago, you know what I want to do? I, I, wrote, I was a field engineer. I rode around with books in my car, like not, you know, big giant books, field manuals. you know, <laughs> field manuals. Cause it, what's this problem? Okay. I need to look up, you know, and it's written, you know, like from, you know, the, the experienced people many years ago and you're like, okay, well, I'll try this, try this, try that. Well, then we evolved to more of a, you know, more of a general call center kind of approach or someone helping in the, the back end and you send data in back and forth. Well, now we can do it right there. Right. And, and that's the thing. And I think that's the, the worker change it you know? So. Right. Yeah, no, you're, yeah, you're, you're right up our alley in terms of, uh, you know, because <laughs> yeah. what you're talking about almost, and and nobody likes the word, but you're, I mean, you're talking almost about a, a, a sentient base of knowledge, right? That's constantly learning, constantly ever evolving, right? And, and, mm -hmm. and the, the AI aspect to all of this is, you know, like you said, if, if you've got, if it's smart tools or sensors or those kinds of things that in real time can tell you, hey, you're, you know, yeah. you, you didn't, you need to torque that a couple, you know, uh, yeah. what is it? Nanometers is what torques measured yeah, yeah. in. Right. Um, you <laughs> yeah. know, you're, you're too off. But pounds, but yeah, 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 absolutely. Whatever. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm definitely not an engineer. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. but you know, if, if you can do that and, but then, then the problem comes, you've got this massive amount of data, right? It's like, yeah. used to, we, we talked about, I mean, that the, whatever the body of water term that gets used, whether it's a data pond, a data lake, a data ocean, right? But you've, you've got these mass amounts of data that you've got to, you've got to transit, you've got to move around in, because right. if you've got more than one factory or even, you know, like sections in your factory, right? Like one yeah. section has to know what's happening over here to be able to, to, to predict what they've got to do. Because if something here changes, now I've got yeah. to change here. And then that, I mean, it's a domino, like you said earlier. What, it's a domino. You know? yeah, it's, it's, and and you, you need that edge compute there because not only the collection of all this information, whether it's from the, the human or the machine or the environment, you know, but also the fact that you need to deploy new scenarios, right? And that's where Software Defined comes in. They, because of Software Defined, they could take that information, deploy while you're sleeping, into your machine, into the computer on board, a new way that the braking system is going to work. The ability to a thing, a car, connect to the internet, talk to it, relay it data back from this onboard com edge computing, right? And then the engineers say, oh, our customer's complaining because they're seeing this type of situation and they deploy a fix into the control system. That's software defined. Now think about that in a factory, right? All of a sudden the line is moving, you've got some kind of thing or you know you're putting out bad product or quality issue product. To be able to make a change into that system today is relatively complex. If you can create a situation where the data, the analytics, and now is matching with a software defined control system that a programmer or data scientist can say, hey, look, we're doing this all wrong. What we really need to do is X instead of Y. Let's just change that tonight. And then when we're ready to start the line, we're ready to go, right? And, or even on the fly. So it's, it's, it's the ability to do that processing and change that, that is so important to that element of productivity. And again, it's, it varies on where you are, you know, do you need it right in, right away or can you take a couple months or you need this much data or that much data? And again, that's why that element of that architecture of your system and what you want it to do comes into play. In Tesla's case, 
they could easily have said, you know what, we'll tell the, we'll, we'll send them a, a text and tell them to drive to the nearest, uh, you know, dealer and then we'll download the fix or do it on site. Well, they, they chose, no, we, we want to, we want to do it through, through the, through the, uh, the cloud and, and they're able to do that. So, and, and their customers love it. I guess. I mean, <laughs> I've heard that they like it. <laughs> right, 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 right. We got to get a Tesla guy out of here to tell yeah, us. Yeah, I know a handful. We yeah. could probably pull in. Um, but this is this is this is the future, and and you know we have software defined in telecom and in, in telecommunications and uh, and networking capabilities to be able to do these things to manage our massive networks of things like that. And ultimately, at the edge factory level, this is kind of the thing that I believe is um, a, a big driver to to us you know, doing more deployments at the edge. So. so to that note, I know we we touched on, you know, there's been a little slower adoption than what you would expect, but given, you know, what we just kind of laid out of the huge, you know, improvements that could be made by, you know, software defined in manufacturing and factories, what do you see the adoption being like in the next, you know, couple of years, five years, 10 years? I mean, to yeah. me, it seems like it'd be a no-brainer to try and get that deployed to to be able to fix stuff easier, faster. But you know, is that yeah. what you expect, or there's still you know we mentioned very at the beginning there's a well, whole bunch yeah. of laggards too. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's hand in hand with the data element and the control element, right? So it's like you, I don't know if it's a it, it, you know a series thing or a parallel thing, uh, but you know obviously you need you need to have that data capability, right? right? So that's first, right? And you got to be able to do that. And then the element of saying, okay, I want to introduce this into this, some sort of process uh, control element is important. Now, where do I see it happening faster? I think in discrete manufacturing, you know, I think area, you know, you, if you take the manufacturing world and, and break it into really three areas, batch processing and, and discrete, and discrete being more of your, um, you know, line build type of thing, automotive, think automotive, think these kinds of things, um, you know, process uh, being more continuous. Um, you know, petrochem is a very continuous thing. You know, oil goes in this end and out comes gasoline and it's got to match all the way around, you know, the whole process. I think it's harder to change in those environments than it is in discrete. Because in discrete, I could do a line, I could do different types of machines, I can focus on particular um, opportunities that I've learned through my, my welding or my this or my, uh, my workers, you know, I learned through my analytics that I can then deploy a different control model. And I think it's easier to do in discrete. So, and I, I think that, that customers are wanting this flexibility. And I think that you're starting to see uh, more capability there. Definitely, software companies are um, picking up the um, the uh, the queue and 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 starting to uh, do more with virtualization and these capabilities that where you can take a virtual machine and and be able to change your change and deploy and and make those changes and be able to do that. And then the next thing is just like, can you do it in real time? Can you do it with the time constraints that you have? Uh, to meet, and that's the other big domino, and 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 um, you know that's where compute comes into play, and capabilities and compute memory uh, accelerators like FPGAs, you know, et cetera, um, graphics processing, all these things that accelerate the process, create that time thing. So really, you're, you, those are the three big things, right? If those things happen, then you start to see more movement there. But I do think discrete is probably the area that's going to move faster. And. So you mentioned one of those keys being the compute of it and, and uh, you know, more, more flexible, more agile, more rugged uh, compute. What are some of the things that, uh, you know, that you guys are working on at Supermicro to, to support some of those efforts? Or, or, or I mean, I, I'm imagining that you guys are because it's a massive space. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. can you are there any projects that you're allowed to kind of talk about or, or even at a high yeah, level? I think, I think there's some broad areas and yeah. we, didn't, we didn't touch on on networking too much, but uh, 5G, right? Um, the other thing with this, the other, another domino, well, at least there's a lot of dominoes on the table, <laughs> but, but um, to be able to do this with um, security, latency issues, you know, and also the deployment of being able to do wireless is key, right? Um, <clears throat> sometimes a solution can be, um, 
the infrastructure costs with wiring all of these different things and all this, it sometimes outweighs the, the, the ROI, right? Because it's so expensive to deploy. And then, of course, you're talking about an environment that's already wired to the nth degree, right? If you, you know, took the cover off and look at the wiring, it's like, it's, it's crazy how much is doing there. So, so wireless capability, in particular, 5G is super important. So, so we have been working at Supermicro around a lot of technologies in that space in terms of hardware with 5G capability that is able to be deployed into these environments. Again, the ruggedized, the industrial environment, we've done an outdoor solution that you know we really like, especially for the telecom space, but it also works in industrial. So these are areas that are, that are important with Supermicro. As the other piece is, again, is again, matching those software capabilities. When I think about the software stack for IoT with the hardware, optimizing those capabilities. So in other words, um, when you deploy a system, let's face it, it's rare that you're going to build a factory from scratch, right? It's, it's, you're going to be deploying in a brownfield situation. So how do I, okay, now I need the data from that sensor, from that sensor, from that device, from that machine. How do I ingest that data? How do I, what software am I using? What protocol? What am I doing? So there's a lot of companies out there that are working on those capabilities. We want to partner. We want to work with them around how to do that. And also sort of get this out of the box experience for an IoT player because that's important too. If if a system integrator is going to deploy in a factory and do all these solutions, they want things to come out ready to go, right? They don't they don't want to have to <laughs> build any software. So so a lot of capabilities we're trying to do inside um, the hardware and optimize the hardware with the software is important. Uh, and then, of course, the piece I mentioned around virtualization, and I think is super important as well, because I think, again, it gives you the capability to do a lot of stuff in, in software defined and a lot of capabilities with workload workload uh, management of being able to containerize things and do things in different areas uh, within that that compute device. So so we want we want capability in there that that puts super micro um, sort of first in terms of thinking about what hardware do I need? Well. Um, these guys have experienced, we've done it, we've got great partners, we've worked with the ecosystem, we're able to do these deployments, and we've got, you know, capabilities like things like 5G and other things that you can do, so, or take advantage of, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's very cool, and, and uh, I guess, uh, I mean, one thing I'm, I'm curious about it in, in, you know, in some of the research that we were doing for our, our you know, our, our talk this morning, or, uh, was this concept of, uh, the industrial 4.0 or that, you know, some people talk about it as the next industrial, I, I hear revolution, it says revolution, really it's an evolution, right? We're, it's we're, an evolution, we're yeah. evolving. Um, mm-hmm. Can you, ex- I mean, I'm again, ignorant to a lot of it, but can, can you just kind of explain what that, when, when people talk about the next industrial evolution, uh, obviously that's around IOT, but specifically yeah. if, if you could, I guess really what I'm asking is more of a magic wand question. You know, if, if you could, and in and, and one fail swoop, wave a wand, and, and industrial is fully maximized. We've evolved. Um, yeah. What does that look like? Yeah, I think it 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 looks uh, like that. You really have uh, a, a degree of autonomy in your factory that you can take advantage of. Um, the f- that leads to advantages and flexibility, advantages and operations, and you're very much in industrial 3.0 a lot of people say automation that was automation and controls right um however it was pretty um scripted and and sort of restricted in a lot of degrees you couldn't necessarily change a lot of the things that were happening there also you know again uh, it was very oem dependent you know uh, and the big you know, the players that were in that space and those systems, it's complex. Um, you know, I know at GE, I mean, I, we felt uh, no one knew how to control a turbine better than we did. We built the thing, right? And and there's there's elements there that have to be understood. At the same time now, you, you moving to this 4.0 environment where I need the flexibility to at least do certain things in that environment that allow me to take advantage 
of what's happening in the marketplace. And energy is a great example because you've got grid fluctuations and grid things. And if you can take advantage of, you know, starting your plant faster or um, being able to uh, understand what's going on in a renewable grid environment and, and then deploy things faster. You know, these are things that allow you that flexibility in a processing or a, a discrete manufacturing. You know, it is about that autonomous kind of environment. So I go from a restricted OT centric environment. I introduced IT and now I'm in this kind of IOT merger. So now what does that give me? It gives me an ability to, to make changes, to go from producing one thing to another to adapt to my environment, to make product changes, control changes that um, uh, allow me to do better quality, uh, allows me to interface with my workers, interface with my customers even. You know, so it's, it's, it's that environment now that gives you that uh, ability to really kind of get out of the, the strings of just being you know, one way and one architected thing and that's it. That's how we make it. And there we go. And all we do is replace devices every 10 to 15 years, you know, we and software. And now we go to an environment where I could deploy things very fast and very solution. So if there's a new software that's doing some analytics or predictive tools that I want to take advantage of, guess what? I can deploy it. I can put it in. It's not a problem. I can do it because I'm getting all this data input from all these different devices and they're all talking to each other. And, and I think that's the magic wand. Like it's just pure, you know, ability to go across, ability for things to talk to each other, ability for things to um, be a- autonomous to some degree. And then a customer or a, a user being able to deploy you know, in a flexible environment. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, when, when we, I, I feel like we're there in some aspects, right. We're, or we're, in some we're aspects, getting yeah. there. Yeah. But it's, uh, I, I feel like that's going to be a long, it's a long road. Well, I don't see That's the thing is I don't think it's a, other than we talk about networking, you know, you know, really low latency, really high reliability, you know, type environments like 5g, you know, the, the, there's new technologies, right. But, um, I mean, if that is not a problem for you in a factory situation, 4G works, right? You can do LTE, you know, it, it depends, right? Where are you in that, in that, you know, in that requirement? Uh, the same with time, right? And, and, and being able to do this, you can do virtualization, it, containers, it, that's been around, right? It's been able to be done in software. The question is, is can you deploy it in a, area where you've got high or low time constraints, right? Like we, we have to respond in microseconds. So, but if you're saying, well, I don't have that requirement, I can respond in, you know, you know one second almost, you know, literally, like it's, it's, it's not a problem, then guess what? Capability exists now, you know? So do you start to get on these paths and start to really, you know, do these things now? Um, and so it's not technology inhibiting to some degree. It's the, the, the far end is, but, some degree, a lot of things have been there. It's just, how do I get, again, like these deployments sort of in, in, involved and it, it comes a, a matter of understanding what you want in your environment and what you want it to look like eventually. Yeah, it sounds like it's more an education thing than, than uh, anything else in a lot of aspects, right? Just educating people that it's there and educating them how to integrate it. Yeah, and, and you know, you, you're seeing some people, a lot of people now have these uh, digital transformation teams you know, uh, that's a big kind of buzzword, your CDO, chief digital officer, you know, and so you see companies, uh, industrial customers, you know, all kinds of companies that are doing this because they're saying, how do I do that, right? I need to hire like people that understand how to get this going because guess what? I got to go produce gas. I got to go drill for oil. I got to produce power. I got to get fish to market. You know, it's, it's like their number one priority is not, converting to an IoT environment, right? It's, it's, it's making sure that this is um, doing. So it's helpful to them, very helpful, very competitive, uh, differentiating, all these different things. But to get there, it's got to be some, you know, they got to put that priority forward and start to really say, okay, I get people to understand this that then can say, all right, these are the technologies we're going to take advantage of. And here's our roadmap. Here's our architecture. Here's what we're doing. Right. And, and that's where, that's why I started. Right. Like, like that's what you have to do as a business to really 
you know, understand like what you want to do and deploy. And, um, but we're, we're seeing that we're, you know, it's not a, it's not just a buzzword. People are actually, you know, really serious about hiring folks like this and, and getting them in their, um, in their uh, manufacturing or their, their uh, businesses. Yeah. I think you bring up some, some really good points. There is, you know, you have some folks that are leading the adoption of it, that they know where it's going. You know, they love the new technologies, you know, but for your majority adoption, late adopters, and even the laggards, you know, this seems like such a huge project, you know, and if you don't have the right roadmap, I mean, you have people who, you know, us, you know, personally is just the way we're genetically made is we don't like change. You know, and so, right. you know, right. some of the things that we've spent the time talking about, I'm sure there's some people who have sweaty palms going, oh my gosh, this is going to disrupt everything. And like, what am I going to do? Um, you know, but it's, to me, it's one of those where it's being able to take the time, you know, which not, yeah. not everybody has time, you know, and the world swings in an instant, which I think we've all obviously seen, um, you know, so where time, you might have more time, you know, in one quarter than the next, but some of these projects aren't exactly one quarter projects, you know, so no, how do no, you, how do you hire the right people to your point who know what they're doing, yeah. who can put that roadmap in and actually give the ROI business case of it's not a four to eight month yep. strategy. It's a 18 to 36 month strategy. And, you know, oh, by the way, we do have to leave some flexibility because in three years, technology is going to be different. You know, so yeah, to yeah. me, it's mm -hmm. it's fun to see the different adoptions and how people do it. And obviously, talking to somebody who's on the inside like yourself is hugely eye opening because you know, Drew and I can look at it at the outside and go, "Okay, that makes sense." Or you just blew my mind on yeah. Tesla. You know, mm -hmm. but what does some of this look like? And you know, who yeah. are the different players that make it? Because we've all interacted with folks who, you know, they you know, despite their age, they have different you know emotional personality levels. You know, I've talked to a yeah, CIO yeah. who's pushing 70, who wants to retire, who's like, no, like that new technology, sure, let's do it. Versus, you know, relatively younger CIO who's, you know, so no, it's antiquated. We know it works. You know, we still have servers from 1995 that are still running. So I'm going to keep them because if I unplug them, I don't know what will happen. I don't know what yeah. happened. That's exactly so, right. That's the, that's the, uh, the quan the, the predicament that they're in, in in that case and so they do want um support mm -hmm. from the ecosystem right support from us you know people that are doing it um and and that's what i've seen that's what actually i think i've been able to see change through this period is i think i there was a time where um a, a company might say we're going to do all of this for our customers end to end, you know, you heard that a lot, <laughs> end to end solutioning, right? And and now it's like, wait a minute, you know, we're not the experts in building servers. We're not the experts in cloud management. We're not the experts in OEM, you know, uh, control software. So what you, you find is people coming together, right? And I think it's driven from an aspect of an end user saying, and that's again, what I would tell them other, other than like getting that plan is talk with your partners about, you know, being those trusted advisors, let's take the competition out of it because everyone, there's enough there for everyone to get their product in, right? It's a, it's a matter of just saying, look, I need to be able to bring in the, the experts in the different areas and make the right choices and decisions so I can get on the, get moving on this, right? And, and get this going. And it, it's everyone from small, very small companies that have great technology and new sensors or, to telecoms with to networking to OEMs to guys like us and ODMs and you know etc and it's, it's so it's bringing that ecosystem together and I think I've seen a lot of I, I've seen that get galvanized in some cases around again some of those customers that are wanting to do it know how to do it they start bringing folks together and um and, you know that's what that's what it needs right because I think a solo act is uh is not the way you're going to be able to do this um I think uh, effectively, right? It, it you, you'll get something, but it it's probably not long term. It's not sustaining. It's not taking into effect a lot of factors, and I think it's important to work together. And what what I've been able to do with in IoT is is really work with across the. I don't think there's any part of the ecosystem I have not worked with system integrators, CSPs. You know, in terms of answering the call or putting out a product solution or getting an IOT solution deployed. We've, we've worked, you know, I've worked with all of them. And I think that 
that it was a maturation process, but it certainly has come together now. So that's a good, that's a benefit for the market, right? Like that folks are now, you know, willing to partner and work together. And, and you see it, you see announcements all the time with, you know, factories teaming up with these folks and that folks. And, and it's, it's just great. It's good for the environment. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's a solid point that people are finally realizing, yes, it's great to have the competition, but at the same time, once once organizations and companies really start honing in on what their core competency is, there's there's more room for partnership. You know, when you when you when you yeah. get away from that end to end, we're gonna do it all when really we're only experts in this section. Let's go find an expert here and an expert here and an expert yeah. here and put out one really good product. And we all benefit because that phenomenal product. It's going to get, yeah. you know, it, it's the whole, yeah. you know, rising tides, lift all boats concept, right? Yeah. And I've, I've always been a believer that you've got to embrace the change, the disruption. If you, you sit out and, and you, I'm going to protect my world, you know, and, and ward it off, you know, and, and customers are screaming for flexibility or screaming for different products in, in this environment. And, and you're trying to, you know, I, I just don't, I think that's a recipe for disaster. I think it's a short term win, but a long term loss. And I think, you know, um, companies are, are definitely that I talk to are, are understanding that, and, you know, this whole conversation we've I've had with other players, major OEM, they're like this and, and end users and other folks. And they, you know, they say, this is very disruptive for me. Right. Uh, I know it's coming. I know I want to do something about it, but it's very disruptive to my business model. And it's like, yeah, I know, but you know, it's, 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 someone's gonna, you know, your competitors are gonna might do this or you, you know, where do you fit in there? So it's important to, understand that as a business where you fit and where you want to go, you know? So. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so Chet, if, if our listeners are interested in connecting with you on social media or, you know, the mm-hmm. work that you're doing and projects that you're working on, uh, how, how can they find you? What's a good way for them to, to reach out to you? LinkedIn is very, probably the best way. I'm on <laughs> LinkedIn. I'm always checking in. I, you know, I love the posts, the shares, um, and activity there. So yeah, just connect with me on LinkedIn, reach out. I'm happy to, um, start a conversation or if you're looking for, again, the partnership <laughs> element, like areas where you think you could help and, and this is um, good. Or if you're a, an end user trying to figure this out and, uh, need some help, then that's something that, uh, you know, we'd be interested in doing too. So. Awesome. Well, you know, Chet, I know I can speak for Drew and I can speak for us at the edge and TMG core. We're incredibly grateful for your time and we appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your insights. It's been incredibly valuable for me for sure. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And I I love talking about this stuff and it's great. And we scratched the surface. There's a lot more probably to debate and go through, but uh, obviously it's a big, it's a big space to talk about, but it's exciting. It's moving. And I think it's a a great time to be, whether you're an industrial IOT or retail or wherever, I think IOT in general, this, this, this whole thing is, is moving really fast and, and, um, it's going to pick up and, and we're going to be able to see some, some new things happen in the marketplace. And that's good for all of us. So, Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us here today on The Edge, a TMG Corp production. Don't forget to subscribe anywhere you pick up your favorite podcast and leave us a five-star review. You can also find us at www.theedgetmgcore.com. Uh, so thanks so much. We'll catch you next time. And remember, The Edge will go as far as you take it. Thanks, guys. What's up, guys? Drew here. And thanks so much for checking out this episode of The Edge. Now, like I said at the beginning of the video, I would share with you what my personal favorite IoT device is. And for me, it's definitely my Apple Watch. I use it for tracking everything from workouts to other health metrics, to streaming podcasts and music when I'm out and I don't have my phone on me, to even using it as an alarm so I can sneak out for that 5 a.m. workout or run without waking up my wife with my big alarm. Now, we're constantly posting new content from virtual events, podcasts, educational seminars, on our channel and you're not gonna wanna miss any of it. So make sure that you like, subscribe, and sign up for notifications so that you're always in the know. And also check out these really cool videos after you smash the subscribe button up top. Now, thanks so much and we'll see you next time.